Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning if you are on the other side of the world. Today, we'll be discussing on uh, operating on mechanical ventilators. Uh, I'll be giving you a simplified version of, simplified way of um, understanding mechanical ventilator and their operation. Um, so, my name is Dr. Binyam Bata. I'm an associate professor uh, of emergency and critical care medicine at St. Paul uh, Hospital Media Medical College, working currently at Abit Hospital, which is an affiliate of St. Paul Hospital here at Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So, so this is uh, the contents I would like to discuss with you regarding the mechanical ventilator. So we'll start with a basic introduction and uh, I will be uh, giving you approaches on how mechanical ventilator works, the remotes, yeah, basic goal of mechanical ventilator and what we want to achieve and uh, what's hypoxia and mechanism of hypoxia. So what, how do we overcome or hypoxia and as well as oxygenation and ventilation and uh, choosing the initial setting for uh, any patient that presents to our AD or and ICU or who requires uh, mechanical ventilators. So after choosing the initial setting, I will be discussing a little bit about uh, ventilator alarms, most ventilator alarms that we usually face and uh, mechanical ventilator associated complications. So as an introduction, Mechanical ventilator is a, modal, a modal, modality or machine that we uh, we commonly use for critically respiratory critical respiratory illness and many other indications, including non-respiratory causes, could be an indication to use a mechanical ventilator. And uh, if you if you don't use the mechanical ventilator properly, as in any other medicine, will cause a serious harm to the patients. So. I will have a different approach to the mechanical ventilator when you compare it to other um, books with related to this mechanical ventilator or lectures. So instead of going through different modes and learning them individually, we're going to try a different approach and a short way of understanding them. So in general, uh, to start, there are three possible ways of uh, brace can be received by the patient or the brace could be delivered or given to the patient by the mechanical ventilator. And uh, there are two possible ways of delivering those breaths. So by understanding these two concepts, you'll be able to deconstruct any, any model of mechanical ventilators and have a clear understanding because all models of mechanical ventilators work in this, uh, in this approach. So, on the first thing I would like to discuss is uh, how does a mechanical ventilator breathe are delivered to the patient or how does the patient receive the breath? So the first meta mechanism is the controlled breath. So uh, controlled breath, as the name states it, it's controlled. It's completely controlled by the, completely controlled by the ventilator and uh, it's delivered at the same as a same time uh, of interval for safety so that inspiratory phase will have a certain time and after that time lapsed the machine recycled to expiratory phase so example of this is if we set uh, mechanical ventilator or the respiratory rate as 12 breaths per minute the ventilator will give breaths every five seconds so the patient will be receiving breaths every five seconds so in this case, it's essential that patient does not do any work of breathing and ventilator kind of does everything for the patient, including inspiration as well as expiration and timing it. And uh, basically patients usually, this control brace are usually found in the OR machine or usually in OR patients are paralyzed so they're not able to initiate breath. So the machine controls every breath. The second more way of a uh, way that a patient could receive a breath is uh, via assisted breath. So 
as the name states, it is an assisted brace. So those braces are delivered to the patient if a patient attempts to brace. So if, when a patient attempts to brace, he will be assisted and he will receive the brace after initiation. And the ventilator senses that the patient is triggering it and delivers the full brace. So an example for this is, uh, you probably have heard of the mode assisted control ventilation. Uh, so only two types of breaths are delivered. In this case, let's say you set respiratory rate as 12 breaths per minute, and then every five seconds, the patient will receive a breath, which is the if every five seconds, if the patient initiates a breath, he will be assisted. And if the patient does not initiate a breath within just five seconds, the machine will control and patient will get a breath. So that's what control is and assist is you patient triggers it and the uh, machine will assist the delivery of the full breath. And the third type of delivery of breath is the supported way or spontaneous breath. So the braces are triggered by the patients, the same as assisted breath with a bit different, which I'll come later, but the mechanical ventilator will only provide some support, not the whole breath, if it's triggered. And depending, depending on the mode that gives support, it could be pressure support or volume support. And, uh, and this kind of uh, breast delivery, we usually do not have, uh, do not need, there is no need to set the respiratory rate because the patient is actually doing the respiration. And uh, though it's only be, will be, supported by either pressure or volume support. Usually we don't find this setting or the delivery of spontaneous braces alone or in a individual setting, but rather it's incorporated in others, in other mode of uh, brace deliveries, such as SIMV plus pressure support combined, which I'll come on the future slides. So this is analogy of uh, what we discussed so far. So the first image shows a control brace. Let's say you have a gym body. So basically you're doing the pull up, but your gym body is technically pulling you up and down. So technically you're not doing any work. So that's more or less a uh, control brace. And when you come to assisted brace, uh, you just have to initiate a little bit of work and uh, the pull up machine with a pulley and the spring system will take over and pull you up. So that is the analogy with the assisted breast. And the analogy with the supported breast is you are able to do some nearly every work, but the ventilator will only support you a little bit or give you a little support, not a full support. Mostly all the job is done, done by the patients. So if we discuss the three, the three ways of delivering a press, well, as he said, one is a uh, controlled press. So where the patient does nothing, only the ventilator will deliver the press, uh, which is which is followed by the, with the set time. So if that set time comes, the press will be delivered. The other one is a called the assisted one. So if a patient is initiating the breathing uh, efforts, so the machine will deliver the full support and the patient will have a full breath. And the third one is the supported one. As the name it says, it's supported. So it only supports a certain aspects of the breathing, but most work is done via the patient. So if we discuss the three ways of delivering a breath, or patient could receive a brace, the coming part will be the two ways of delivering those brace. So how can I, how does a mechanical ventilator press? There are two options. The first is volume brace. So once the patient is, once the mechanical ventilator is triggered, be it time triggered or it's controlled or patient triggered or assisted breasts, the MV will provide the preset tidal volume in case of uh, volume brace. In the volume brace, the patient will give him the full tidal volume or that we set. So once the preset uh, tidal volume is delivered by the machine, 
than the Martian cycles to exhalation. So the drawback in this is, is when you deliver a volume of breath, you don't know how much pressure it took to deliver that breath. And the pressure depends on the lung compliance. That is compliance, you probably heard it in a lot of uh, books regarding mechanical ventilator or lung physiology. The lung compliance implies the ability of the lung to stretch or how much volume could uh, lung received by applying the pressure or in the formula it's change in volume divided by the change in pressure so if it's the lung stiff and uh, fluid filled then definitely you will need a lot more pressure to deliver a set tidal volume and if vice versa the other way around if the lung is uh, compliant or not stiff you will need small pressure to deliver that volume so that's what i mean when I said you won't be able to tell how much pressure it took to deliver the press. So in volume, be it assisted or control, we need to observe the, the pressure that it took to deliver the press. Well, the good way of checking it would be to assess the plateau pressure. Plateau pressure, well, the definition is it's a pressure required to distend the smaller airways and alveoli. So it's the pressure required to distend the smaller airways and the distal airways and as well as the alveoli. So high plateau pressure indicates problem with a patient's lung compliance. So if you take if it takes a lot of pressure to deliver a certain volume, it's obvious that the lung might be stiffened or yeah, other cause could be there to make the lung stiffen. So the goal here is to keep the plateau under 30 centimeters of water whenever we ventilate the patients, but there is a catch to that. Usually, uh, mechanical and mechanical ventilators, most mechanical ventilators do not display P plateau. So we have to do a maneuver to assess where the P plateau is one option. So how do we check that? We add the time for end inspiratory hold. We put it 0 0.5 to one second. So by making that, you are making after inspiration, you are creating a delay before the onset of expiration. So by making that delay, you will be able to see the peak uh, inspiratory, uh, I mean, peak plateau or uh, plateau pressure. So, but other than the uh, plateau pressure, the mechanical ventilator usually, all, almost all, will display the peak inspiratory pressure, be it either in graphs or in number. So it will indirectly tell you that what's going on, peak inspiratory pressure. Indirectly will tell you about the plateau pressure. So um, what does peak inspiratory pressure imply? It is the maximum pressure that's needed to deliver uh, air or breath during active inspiration. And it is the sum of all the, the pressures that it is needed to deliver that breath through the conducting tubes, the AT tube, the large proximal airways, as well as the smaller airways and alveoli. So technically, peak inspiratory pressure is the summation of the plateau pressure and other pressures that are generated as air has to, other pressures that will be generated as air pass through the ET tube, the trachea, and the larger airways, including the PIP. So this is a graphical representation of what uh, peak inspiratory pressure implies. So as you can see, peak inspiratory pressure, the graph starts from the bottom, that is, uh, and goes up, overcoming the uh, proximal airways, including the larger airways, the AT tube, the trachea, and finally hitting the final distal airways or the alveoli, then where we, have, where we achieve the peak inspiratory pressure, followed by a drop. And this line implies the plateau pressure. So in between the plateau pressure, the plateau pressure and the peak in part, the difference between will be the resistance or the resistance of the larger airways. So airway resistance is the difference between peak and respiratory pressure minus peak plateau or plateau pressure. Normally it should not exceed more than five centimeters of water. If it exceeds, it, in, it indicates there is 
uh, resistance in the airway, especially to the smaller and middle airways. So usually associated with asthma or COPD. And one thing I didn't mention was the PEEP. PEEP indicates, as the name it states, is a positive positive end expiratory pressure. It's the pressure during expiratory phase that prevents the alveoli from collapsing. So the balloon analogy also comes here in a play. Uh, usually the balloon at the end uh, of expiration, we don't want it to collapse completely because which I will come more, the reason which I'll come, will come, I'll cover later, but the main reason being, if you let it collapse until the end one, it will be difficult to initiate and express. So you have to overcome that part and uh, probably uh, give that. And the other one is about related with oxygenation, oxygenation, which I will cover in the coming slide. Just know that PEEP is the positive end expiratory pressure. Usually physiologic PEEP is five. So you don't want it to be low. And depending on the reason or depending on the pathogenesis or depending on the lung condition, you might have to increase PEEP, which I will come later again. So this is a, a table showing comparing the difference between peak inspiratory pressure and plato uh, pressure. That is, if you have both increased peak inspiratory pressure and both increased peak plateau pressure, what does those things imply? They imply that there is a problem with the lung compliance. So where does the compliance problem issue raises? What can cause the uh, lung to be non-compliant or stiff or the compliance uh, to decrease? Include acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, pulmonary contusion, pulmonary edema, pulmonary effusion if it's significantly large and uh, tension pneumothorax. And if there is circumferential wall burn, uh, chest wall burn, so that chest won't be able to expand. So that will uh, increase the lung stiffness and decrease compliance. The other one is massive ascites, which is associated with the movement of the diaphragm. So it will also create a pressure from the abdominal compartment. So that will also affect the lung compliance, as well as the abdominal compartment syndrome and the pneumonia being uh, consolidated and uh, fluid filled lung also contribute to the both increase in peak and respiratory pressure and plateau pressure. The other one is when you have increased peak and respiratory pressure, that is a pressure to overcome the larger airway, the smaller airway and the alveoli, and when it's peaked, uh, despite the plateau pressure being lower, so, or unchanged. This usually implies there is some form of obstruction. That could be due to ETT obstruction, or bronchospasm, or asthma, or mycospoleoking in the case of asthma or uh, bronchitis. <clears throat> so we have discussed uh, volume breaths. So delivery of the uh, breaths via volume. And the second part I would like to do, uh, way of delivering a brace is by a pressure breath. So <clears throat> in this pressure breath, well, as the name states, if you compare it from the previous volume, the preset pressure will be delivered once mechanical ventilator is triggered. So it could be triggered, as we mentioned earlier, could be time controlled uh, breast or patient effort assisted breast. So it could be a controlled breast or assisted breast. So in this mode, the, uh, the preset pressure is reached instantly. And, and the pressure stays there for a certain time or the inspiratory time. So after this inspiratory time has been achieved, then it will, the machine will cycle to exhalation. So as we said earlier, when we were talking about the volume, we don't know what pressure we have. Yeah, when we deliver a certain volume. But in this case also, that also works because we're giving a certain pressure, but a volume might be different depending on the lung compliance. So ideally, we need to calculate the tidal volume. And we have to ensure that calculate the tidal volume will reach to the <clears throat> are delivered to your patients uh, via pressure. So usually tidal volume should be greater than 4 ml per kg and not le and less than 8 ml per kg based on the ideal body weight, which I will come on the next slide, which is 
based on the patient type. So patient weight does not actually mean the lungs it does not uh, actually correlate with the tidal volume. Rather than patient height is correlated with the ideal body weight or predicted body weight. So uh, one more thing you don't have to forget is don't forget the volume. The volume you're gonna achieve at certain pressure is dependent on the lung compliance for obvious reasons. So the stiff lung may require a larger pressure to deliver the estimated uh, tidal volume. So this is the uh, ideal body weight estimation or the predicted body weight estimation. It's both in inches and centimeters. So if you're using the metric system, you can use 50 plus 2.3 uh, times height in centimeter minus 152 divided by 2.54 could give you the predicted uh, body weight. So we can estimate the body weight in males and as well as in females where it is 45.5 plus 2.3 uh, times height in centimeters uh, minus 152 divided by 2.54. So this is ideal body weight. So based on this ideal body weight, we will estimate the tidal volume to be in between 4 ml per kg up to 8 ml per kg. So whenever we are doing putting uh, pressure, so we need to check that the ideal or the predicted tidal volume is achieved. <clears throat> so whenever we, uh, so the point being here is when we put a patient on a pressure mode, we need to constantly check the tidal volume because tidal volume may be variable. So physiologically, we breathe on decelerating flow. That is, it will take a uh, fast time to peak or the pressure to be delivered to the lungs and slowly drop down. That is the physiology, which will be important, especially in relation to the management of ARPs, which we'll see in the future. So by now you have figured out, <laughs> uh, by knowing type of breast delivery and type of breasts, you may know many modes already. So let's go to specific modes. So if you have the initial, the, if you understand what we have been discussing so far, the modes will not be any difficulty to you. So there are different modes uh, depending on the generation of the mechanical vent ventilator or the time it was produced or the year it was produced. But mostly those mechanical ventilators always function in the parameters that I told you earlier. That is, there are two ways of the uh, patient could receive a press, and there are uh, there are three ways of a patient could receive a press, and two methods of delivering them. So, patient could receive a press via controlled, or assisted, or spontaneous. Or, a patient will be delivered the ventilation or the brace will be delivered, be it assisted, controlled, or spontaneous, via volume or pressure braces. So, those modes are in combination of those. So the first mode I want to discuss is in this part is uh, volume assisted control or ACVCV mode or VACV mode. So so means the same. So in this mode, we need to set the respiratory rate, uh, the tidal volume or the tidal volume based on the predicted or uh, ideal body weight and the PEEP, FiO2, that is function of, uh, functional respiration oxygen and uh, the flow rate. So far, we haven't discussed on the flow rate, but I will come what it means to, to say the flow rate. So some machines in volume mode do not have the IE when in respiratory time, or uh, you can only see what IE ratio is. But you will indirectly control the IE ratio by manipulating the flow. So if you're using high flow rates, high flow rate, obviously the inspiratory time will be shortened and the expiratory time will be uh, prolonged yeah. and vice versa. So if you're using a uh, lower flow rate, so the I time will be prolonged and expiratory time will be shortened. So an example to this is, let's say you set the respiratory rate at 12 and tidal volume at 500 ml. So we said it's uh, assist control. So what the name is, says, it is assist and control way of delivering brace. So if a patient does not trigger uh, the brace 
or does not have any trigger or the parent is paralyzed or not uh, initiating brace, then the machine will deliver brace every 15 seconds. So in total, you will have 12 brace per minute. So whenever this uh, cycle is triggered, the brace, uh, patient will uh, get a uh, brace. 500 ml volume will be delivered to her every five seconds if the patient fails to trigger. So what if the patient triggers? Okay, when the patient triggers, so it will be assisted to have a 500 ml volume because it's volume assist control. So volume will be delivered whether the patient triggers, so it will be assisted. And if a patient fails to trigger, the set uh, volume will be delivered with the preset time or the respiratory rate per minute to the patient. So here's the catchy part. What if the patient is triggering brace faster than the brace or we have set, or let's say we have set in 12, yeah? So the patient is having 15 breaths per minute total. So the patient will receive the 12 that we have set, be it assisted, or, and the other three that he's initiating will be assisted by volume. So he'll get an extra three breaths of 500 ml if the patient is actually breathing at 15 breaths per minute. So in this case, again, back to square one, we need to check the plateau pressure. Well, we said plateau pressure should be less than 30, 30 centimeters of water, yeah? So plateau pressure should be checked or else the patient will have a develop ventilator-induced lung injury and barrel trauma and resulting in pneumothorax and etc. So we need to check the pressure plateau. So let's say that we haven't... Uh, Let's say that, as I told you earlier, P plateau might not be there. So in this case, we need to check the peak in inspiratory pressure and maybe put on an inspiratory hold and check the plateau pressure. Or some machines may display the plateau pressure. So based on that, we should act to decrease the plateau pressure less than centimeter, less than 30 centimeter of water. Okay, the other mode is pressure assisted control or ACPCV mode. Usually in this uh, mode, a lot of uh, mechanical ventilators, we set the respiratory rate to be 12 to 16 breaths per minute. And the pressure that we want to be delivered, PEEP and FIO2, I time, which indirectly said to be IE ratio. So I time might be there, will be there in uh, pressure assist control. And don't forget, I told you earlier, ITAM might not be present on volume control, so some we may have to manipulate the flow rate. So, what pressure should we put? Physiologically, pressure should be put eight centimeters of water and above. And uh, after setting eight and above, we need to take the estimated or predicted tidal volume and increase the pressure to achieve this tidal volume. So let's say respiratory rate is set to be 12 and pressure set to be 14 centimeters of water. Then if the patient is not triggering or is not initiating a breath, then he will receive 14 centimeters of water pressure every five seconds. So, and uh, if a patient is triggering one, he will be assisted. And if a patient is breathing more than 12 or the set respiratory rate, every respiratory rate other, other than the 12 will be assisted. So he will get 14 centimeters of water, whether it triggers, whether the patient triggers it or assisted or patient uh, does not trigger and you receive a control brace. So again, don't forget tidal value, tidal mm, volume may vary with each individual brace, uh, but generally keep the tidal volume in the range of four to eight ml per kg, four being the lowest limit and eight being the upper limit. And also, and this time, <coughs> we could also adjust the inspiratory time, yeah? So adjusting I time can determine the expiratory time because if you adjust I time for expiratory rate of 12, so a patient will have, five uh, every five seconds you'll have a brace yeah so the first uh, minutes the first second will be the inspiration and the rest will be four 
Second should be given to the respiratory rate, keeping in mind the patient has no other respiration, only 12 respiration total. So if you have 20 breaths per minute, then uh, if you have uh, 20 breaths per minute, then you'll receive breaths every four seconds. So if you said I time is one, then you'll receive expiratory time to be three seconds. Okay. The other mode I want to discuss is the Fraser support ventilation mode. Uh, in this mode, we, are, we discussed the support mode. So the support braces, the patient uh, will be able to do most of the breathing and patients able to initiate the brace and uh, have enough strength to take the tidal volume. It's assumed that patient has this. So we will support them at a certain support. So it depends what uh, support we give is pressure support or volume support. So usually in this setting, it's not common to find uh, in current uh, ventilators, but we all find this in this uh, setting, especially in if you are about to do spontaneous breeze uh, trial. So usually there is no respiratory rate to be set because the patient is initiating a brace and uh, no volume to be set, but rather we'll adjust uh, minimal pressure support to set and pressure support ventilation mode. So you'll be assessing whether the patient is getting the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. So based on that, you may increase the pressure support to augment the tidal volume or to increase the tidal volume. Usually, as I mentioned earlier, usually we use this mode if a patient can be extubated. So we do spontaneous breast trial, uh, which we'll be discussing uh, when we are covering the weaning, not today, but maybe in the future. So it could be used to assess spontaneous breast trial. So PSCB will deliver a set pressure until the inspiratory flow decreases. So when does the pressure cycle happen? So you will have inspiration. And uh, as the flow will decrease as certain percent peak, uh, the peak flow, at a certain percent of peak flow, usually at 25% of the peak flow, then it will cycle to exhalation. So if you say 40% for the cycling of the peak flow, then the cycle, uh, it will cycle expiration sooner. So if you say 50%, so all the 15% uh, below the peak, then you have to wait till the 50% below the peak is achieved, then it will cycle to expiration. Usually, as I mentioned earlier, there is no need to set eye time in PSCV, unlike ACPCV, because it's only supported and the patient is actually controlling its own brace. Meaning, patient is controlling the rate. Uh, we don't find this mode usually alone. We usually find this mode uh, in combination with other modes, which I'll come in the coming, which I'll cover in the coming slides. So. There is a volume SIMV or volume synchronized in intermediate mandatory ventilation plus PSV. In this mode, we are capable of delivering three types of press. So we can deliver the controlled, the assisted, and the supported. So it has a wide parameter. So you can play in this wide parameter, we can manipulate it. So in this mode, you will be able to set the respiratory rate. So you determine what the patient will have uh, breast per minute that you will achieve. The tidal volume, because as I told you, it's volume synchronized intermediate mandatory ventilation. So the PSV plus the PSV, the pressure support we want to add, and the flow rates. Flow rate is important to determine IE ratio because we are still using the uh, volume delivery in this case, and the PEEP and FIO2 functional inspirational oxygen or the percentage of oxygen that we want to deliver. So let's say we set the respiratory rate at 12 in volume SIMV with the tidal volume of 500 mAh. So your patient will get a volume control brace at 500 mAh every five seconds if there is no adequate respiratory drive or uh, a volume assisted breath will be added. If the patient does not receive, but does not initiate a breath, and you will have 12 breaths per minute with the volume of 500 ml. And if a patient is able to trigger the, that breath, which is a set 12 breaths, 
he will be given the assist of 500, achieving of 500 uh, ml of volume of tidal volume. So, so they get mandatory 12 breaths. Uh, so mandatory breaths meaning the rate that you set is equals to the number of mandatory breaths. Be it controlled or assisted, if they trigger it every second, will be given to them, be assisted. If they don't trigger it, 12 breaths will be given controlled. What happens if a patient wants to breathe more or if a patient wants to breathe in between those five seconds or the set 12 uh, respiratory rate? Then the braces will be supported, meaning, if you remember earlier, when uh, we're using assisted control, the, if a patient's able to initiate brace greater than the set uh, respiratory rate, it will be supported, uh, be it volume or pressure assist. It will be assisted via volume or pressure. But in this case, there wouldn't be no assist. The only thing we patient will be having is a support or the pressure support or the pressure support that we set. So we call this spontaneous breathing or spontaneous breathing will be supported with pressure. So this is another mode that we call volume SIMV plus Mm, PSCB or pressure support inhibition. So I said that's the fourth mode and the fifth mode will be vice versa. So if we said pressure SINV mode plus pressure support, uh, we'll have instead of uh, then this mode getting this mandatory braces as volume, there will be Pressure. So, because we already say we already said pressure, so rather than volume, they will get pressure support. So, let's say we set respiratory rate 12 with a pressure of 14 centimeter of water. So, and respiratory rate 12. So, if patient fails to initiate the respiratory rate, you'll get five seconds every five seconds. Then you'll be supported with the 14 pressure, and you will have that 12 respiratory rate. If a patient wants to breathe more, he only get the pressure support, not the PSV, not the pressure delivery. So the patient won't get to 14 centimeter of water, but rather the PSV we set. And this thing on the pressure SIMV mode, similar to uh, pressure AC, we set the respiratory rate, the pressure, the uh, IE, the PEEP, FiO2 plus the PSV. So the mandatory brace of 12 that we set, if we set 12, 12 mandatory braces will be delivered with the pressure assist or pressure control if a patient wants more to breathe more he only gets the pressure support that we see it not assist uh, hopefully it's clear so far i'm not seeing any question in the chat room so i think i can continue so sorry go back so Pressure regulated volume control. This is usually this is mode is considered. It's a new mode. Usually, recent mechanical ventilators will have this mode. You don't expect to find this on every mechanical ventilators, but uh, recently made or recently developed mechanical ventilators will have this mode. Okay, this mode is considered a pressure mode, as braces are delivered via. This uh, decelerating inspiratory flow, which is like more like the physiology, but targets the tidal volume to ensure adequate tidal volume is achieved. And adequate tidal volume is achieved despite what the lung compliance is. So braces could be controlled or assisted as uh, others. Uh, but the differences in this case, and PR, uh, VC, or pressure regulated volume control state. The mechanical ventilator does all the calculation for you and uh, usually delivers the set tidal volume as the possible lowest pressure. So it prevents uh, lung injury. So this is more of a new uh, modality. So you might not find it on all, the, on all ventilators, but if you do, it's interesting and uh, wonderful because it does a good job for you. You don't have to sit down and monitor the peak and aspiratory pressure or the plateau pressure every time because the machine will be doing it for you and giving you an alarm based on what is there. So if we say this far on modes 
and I hope it's very clear. And if any doubts, bring it. Uh, if you have any questions, please forward it. No questions so far. Okay. So, what's our goal in mechanical ventilation? Before going to the goals, we need to know the indications. Who should we keep on mechanical ventilator? Who should we put on mechanical ventilator or intubate? So, usually, the most common causes of uh, indication, the more common indications for mechanical ventilators include respiratory hypoxemia, refractory hypoxemia, sorry, whenever there is hypoxia with the uh, oxygen saturation and the blend drops less than 90 degree saturation drops less than 90 percent or the partial arterial oxygen drops less than 60 millimeters of mercury of oxygen so that's an indication for mechanical uh, ventilation and if a patient is not maintaining his saturation despite being on high flow uh, oxygen be it non-invasive then we need to put on the invasive mechanical ventilation the other one is increased work or breathing. If a patient is breathing so fast, breathing more than 35 uh, breaths per minute constantly, well, as we all know, the physiology, the about 20% of the cardiac uh, output goes to the intercostal muscles, diaphragm, and uh, accessory muscle. Overall, the respiratory muscle. So <clears throat> if you have uh, increased work or breathing, you will consume a lot of oxygen. So it will contribute to the underlying problem. So we don't want to have increase work of breathing. The other indication is apnea leading to inadequate ventilation. Could be many other reasons. Could be atherogenic when we put patients uh, unconscious or paralyzed when we are about to take him to OR or due to trauma, head trauma, a patient is not actually breathing, of course, spinal trauma, higher spinal trauma, so patient is not breathing, or if you have any apnea, other cause of apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, etc. They will need, there will be a need for mechanical ventilation because there will be inadequate ventilation. The other one is inability to protect their way. So usually inability to protect our way related with consciousness. So being iatrogenic, lot of consciousness when we put a patient under induced coma or we, need, we put a patient uh, on paralysis or sedative when we take him to the OR or we don't want the patient to have to be awake when we put induced coma in the ICU. So in this case, the patient will not be able to protect airway or the other one is having trauma, head trauma. So GCS might be low. So GCS less than eight, patient will not be able to protect his airway. So we need to put a patient on mechanical ventilator or intubate the patient then put on mechanical ventilator once it's intubated to protect the airway. So I want to say we put them on mechanical ventilator. What's our goal? What are we trying to achieve when we put ventilator, when we put someone on a ventilator? Basically, we are trying to achieve is to provide adequate oxygenation or give oxygen and ventilation, removal of carbon dioxide from the bloodstream. And the other thing is reduce the patient's work of breathing. So patients does not have actually to do the work of breathing. The patient will be sedated and a mechanical ventilator does all the breathing for the patients. The other one is minimizing damage to the lung. Our goals are to minimize the, lung, the damage to the lung, be it uh, due to the underlying issue or Due to the mechanical ventilator, we need to minimize the lung, the lung injury. So those are our main goals when we put someone in on a ventilator. And uh, didn't mention a lot of indications, including uh, acidosis or metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis. Other causes are not mentioned, but the commonest causes are related, relatively related to this. So. We agreed hypoxia being low oxygen saturation or uh, low blood uh, oxygen pressure, that is less than 60 millimeters of mercury or saturation less than 90%. So usually mechanism of hypoxia are important understanding the mechanism of hypoxia because depending on that, the setting of our ventilator might vary. And those classification are obviously are there for uh, to better understand the underlying problem. And there might be overlap between those classification. So those classification exist for study purposes, studying purposes. So always know there might be some overlap in between. 
so the first uh, principal mechanism of hypoxemia could present or exist is due to ventilation perfusion mismatch. This is decreased ventilation relative to, relative to perfusion or vice versa. That is, whenever there is no, <clears throat> the lungs might have uh, good ventilation, or air might be getting in, but there might not be circulation to the pulmonary bed or the pulmonary arterial bed or capillary bed. In that case, they will be affected and the perfusion mismatch will lead to hypoxia. Or the other way around, but there is a flow but no ventilation. That's another uh, perfusion ventilation perfusion mismatch. The other cause is shunting. This is an extreme form of uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. This, this is due to lack of regional ventilation. So blood passing to the pulmonary capillary fails to get oxygen. As I, I said earlier, there is a might be overlap. So just for class, for study purposes. So the other causes that could result in uh, hypoxia is hypoventilation. That is a decreased in the bulk flow of the air in and out of the lungs, which result in the buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. Usually, this feature is characterized by hypercap hypercapnia. So, there will be the carbon dioxide level or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream will increase, usually greater than 45 millimeters of mercury. So, that co that's called what we call hypercarbia or hypercapnia causes this. Uh, hypoventilation could lead to this reason, so you know, consequently leading to hypoxia. So the other cause of uh, hypoxia could be diffusion defect. So whenever there is thickening of alveolo-capillary membrane, so the diffusion distance between the alveoli to the bloodstream will increase. So it will be difficult or it will be insufficient or for the oxygen to cross this membrane and join the circulation or get attached to the hemoglobin. So usually this is diffusion defect or thickening of the alveolar capillary membrane. The last and but not least is the low barometric pressure. This is uh, whenever we have decreased in a, in a spiral fraction out of all two, obviously, if you take less oxygen, you will be hypoxic. So it doesn't take that much to figure out, but usually related to the uh, barometric pressure, let's say, living on an altitude, well, at sea level, we expect the uh, oxygen level to be 20, 21%. So as we attain higher altitudes, the barometric pressure will drop and the percentage of oxygen will also be dropping. So we don't expect it to be 21. So this could cause uh, hypoxia or due to lack of or delivery of oxygen. The other one is whenever we are in an enclosed space, when the atmospheric oxygen will decrease, so it causes hypoxia. So this is a main five cause of hypoxia. So how can we uh, oxygenate or ventilate on mechanical ventilator? What does it mean to oxygenate we are, when we are considering it uh, via the mechanical ventilator? So usually on oxygen, oxygenation is controlled by the peak, uh, I mean the um, positive end pressure positive end pressure and FiO2, and ventilation is controlled by uh, tidal volume and respiratory rate. And don't forget tidal volume and respiratory rate, when they multiply, they give minute ventilation. So whenever there is a minute ventilation decrement, or if it decreases, there will be accumulation of carbon dioxide, so ventilation is affected. So that's what it means. But in reality, I'm not saying PIP is not a determinant of uh, FiO2 or uh, PIP is not a determinant of oxygenation, but in reality, mean arterial pressure plays a larger role in uh, oxygenation. So what does it mean when I say mean arterial pressure? So mean arterial pressure is uh, an average pressure in your lungs, where an average pressure within your lung is exposed to during inspiration and expiration, inspiration and expiration. So mean uh, airway pressure is the pressure inside the lung during inspiration and during expiration. So as a mean, an average one. So mean arterial I mean, uh, airway pressure helps oxygenation by allowing the redistribution of oxygen from highly compliant alveoli where air can easily go through to the least compliant alveoli. So it will play the major role in uh, oxygenation. What, you, what I mean by that is, 
So whenever we say it, any mode of uh, ventilation, be it pressure delivery or volume delivery, we are at, fine, at the end of the day, we're increasing the mean airway pressure. So if you increase the mean airway pressure, it improves oxygenation because diffusion of oxygen takes place physiologically during inspiration and expiration at the alveoli level, yes? So oxygen diffusion takes place both in, during inspiration and expiration uh, at the alveoli level. So it's not, an, it's not, uh, does not only take during inspiration, it's not a safe point. So it will take diffusion at any time. So having mean air pressure will, uh, having a mean air pressure will contribute to this uh, constant diffusion of oxygen. And also PEEP, which I'll come now. Technically, we spend more time during expiration, right? Because in physiologically, we breathe one second for inspiration and two to three seconds for expiration. Physiologically, we spend more time during expiration as we just physiologically not think of So PEEP works mostly during expiration. So what does PEEP do? If you remember the previous slide, PEEP keeps the alveoli open a whole time during expiration. There is no collapsing of alveoli. So if the alveoli is open during expiration, that means there will be diffusion of oxygen. Yeah, right? So there will be diffusion of oxygen despite being on expiration, okay? So it will help oxygenation. So if you remember your systolic and diastolic formula, uh, yeah, mean arterial pressure, not mean air pressure this time, if you remember your diastolic and systolic pressure, the mean, the mean uh, arterial pressure comes near to the diastolic than the systolic, right? So this analogy works for this too. So the mean arterial pressure, mean airway pressure is mostly affected by people than the pressure or the upper or the peak inspiratory pressure. Rather than it's morally affected by the mean arter arterial pressure. If you want to calculate mean airway pressure, we rely on PEEP. PEEP has more contribution. So that's why it means to have a PEEP for better oxygenation. Indirectly, we're talking about mean airway pressure. So this is a graph. This is a pressure time curve graph that you see here. So all the blue shaded areas are the mean airway pressure, which is under the curve. And this, the mean airway pressure is the time, uh, the pressure that's important for oxygenation, as we mentioned earlier, yeah? So let's say we want to increase the mean airway pressure. How do we do that? Okay, we have two options. How, we wanna, how do you wanna increase this uh, blue area? What I would do is one, to increase the PEEP. So if I make the PEEP here, the blue shaded area, if I, big, if I make the PEEP higher, the blue shaded area will increase. So increasing PEEP will increase the mean airway pressure, so it will increase oxygenation. Wonderful. What else could we do? We increase the eye time, inspiratory time. So as I increase the inspiratory time, so this table or this graph will have more larger area for the blue or the mean airway pressure will be increased. So indirectly, I'm increasing the oxygenation. So the footnote is just, just saying, <laughs> saying if you are able to lengthen the inspiratory time and keep the inspiratory pressure for a long period of uh, time, you'll improve oxygenation, aka inverse ratio of ventilation that is employed in uh, ARD. So technically, increases the mean airway pressure will also increase the uh, oxygenation. So that's what I mean when I say mean airway pressure is important to increase the oxygenation. So how can you manipulate mean airway pressure? by manipulating the PEEP and by manipulating the inspiratory time, prolong the inspiratory time so that the pressure will be given for a prolonged time of inspiration. So the mean airway pressure will be increased. So increasing the oxygenation. Okay. Optimal PEEP is highly important. I will come back to PEEP again. I'm not saying I'm discredit discrediting PEEP. I agree PEEP is should be optimally increased because the consequences are there if you are not increasing the PEEP. So the reason we increase the PEEP, as you mentioned earlier, keeps alveoli open and maintains adequate alveolar surface area for oxygen to diffuse during expiration. And another thing is, which one is easy? If you want to blow the balloon every time, if you keep it a certain level or if you deflate it at the end, every time you deflate it at the end, you have to start from the elastic force to inflate it again. But if you keep a, uh, at a certain pressure or 
open or a uh, bit inflated when during expiration of uh, the balloon or the alveoli, whenever you start freezing or inserting a pressure, then the, the balloon will react fast or will be filled easily or does not need much more pressure than to deflate an empty, but, um, empty balloon. So that's another purpose. The other one is uh, if you don't, if you let your alveoli collapse, between inspiration during insp during expiration, if you let your alveoli collapse, what happens is the collapsing and inflating the collapsing and inflating uh, scenario will create <coughs> shear stress or the alveoli epithelial will be injured because due to opening and closing, opening and closing will result in uh, stress in the alveoli, so it will cause arterial trauma or ventilator induced lung injury. So we need a PIP. PIP should be optimized. Okay, cool. So the other way of increasing the flow, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the other way of improving oxygenation, as I mentioned earlier, physiologically, we have a decelerating pressure curve, yes? So if you manipulate the shape of the brace that you're delivering, you will have uh, <clears throat> an improvement in oxygenation. Usually the mechanical ventilators will have Diagrams showing uh, diagrams showing whether it is uh, decelerating or uh, box shape or uh, it's increasing. Usually they will have features like this. Hopefully you'll see, you'll be able to see. So as you can see, this is as in at the uh, onset of inspiration. At this case, that is ascending one. Yeah. And this one is a box type, and one is descending type. So we, physiologically, we have the descending type. So some machines will have this option, so it will help you. <coughs> uh, usually, they have it on top corner, and it will help you for oxygenation. So you can manipulate this uh, to increase the oxygenation. So you can take advantage of this. So flow waveforms might be used one might be used to improve oxygenation. But the main important point to be taken is to increase oxygenation, we may have to affect FiO2. Of course, the oxygen you give is higher than you'll have high oxygen level. And uh, PEEP, which is technically the mean airway pressure, so you can uh, adjust the PEEP and affect the inspi uh, inspiratory time. So it will affect the mean airway pressure, so you'll have good oxygenation. So keep in mind, then the last option is flow waveforms, OK? So <clears throat> we have to do some compromises whenever we do ventilation in ARD, in ARD patient. So let's say uh, we have to give volumes increase up to 7 to 8 ml per kg. So long, as long as the plate of pressure remains below 30 centimeters of water and the presence of CPR hypoxemia or acidosis, plate of pressure may be a lower temporarily to be raised below 30 centimeters. So if you are acting on a patient on ARD patient, you may increase the pressure, eye time, and uh, the PEEP. And you may allow the uh, for a temporary time till the hypoxemia is resolved to increase the uh, peak inspiratory pressure or plate of pressure could be left higher. But don't forget, it's only for temporary time, uh, temporary reason. Otherwise, we'll uh, develop lung injury. The other one is to decrease the FIO2. High FIO2 levels are capable of uh, exacerbating lung injury, or and high peeps could also cause uh, induced trauma. So therefore, it's as long as there is improvement in hypoxia, always up or down FIO2 and peep, and keep the acceptable range. So this is a compromise whenever it is RDS. So. Keep in mind whenever in choosing initial setting for uh, ARDS, always think of these things. What do we need to compromise and for how long? Okay. So let's go to the choosing of initial setting. So basically, there is not any recommendations that prefers one mode of pressure or volume mode. There is no recommendation which prefers one over the other, but it depends where you are and whether you are comfortable at what mode you are comfortable at and what uh, factors you want to manipulate. Example being, if I want to manipulate tidal volume, I would prefer to start with volume. So I would have a certain volume delivered, but I won't be able to 
able to monitor the pressure or I may not be able to actually influence the pressure, but I can manipulate the volume. And if I'm more interested in controlling the pressure than the volume, I will choose the pressure mode. But at the end of the day, do whatever you are comfortable at. Use uh, the mode that you feel comfortable. So always say the mechanical ventilator online protective strategies. So to avoid any doing harm and uh, to avoid any ventilator induced lung injury. So lung protective injuries, uh, lung protective strategy, strategies having a uh, tidal volume of six to eight ml per kg based on the ideal body weight, which we discussed earlier, regardless of the volume or the pressure or pull on volume calculated based on this, set this volume based on this calculation, this uh, estimation. And if it's pressure, always keep an eye on the pressure that, that is generated. And uh, if you're on pressure mode, keep an eye on the volume that's generated. And it should be between 6 to 8 ml per kg. If you make it higher, then you are having issue, will have, uh, will have issues with related with um, lung injury. So always uh, monitor the tidal volume. So, so if you pressure mode, always keep an eye on the volume. And uh, this thing does not work is severe metabolic acidosis or obstructive pathology. This actually works for any ARDS causes, uh, acute, uh, acute respiratory distress syndromes, be it cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, this works. But this does not function. It is, uh, it's not recommended to use this with severe metabolic acidosis or obstructive pathology. If you have usually severe metabolic acidosis, you want to remove the carbon dioxide, so you need to give more tidal volume ventilation. So, or increase the rate or tidal volume, remove more air. If it's obstructive pathology, yes, you want more uh, tidal volume to remove the carbon dioxide. Also, you need to manipulate the expiratory time. You need more expiratory time to remove the carbon dioxide also. So this application of uh, lung protective mechanism may not be applicable for uh, severe metabolic acidosis or obstructive physiology. Otherwise, for any, uh, normal patient or an, with a patient with no lung pathology or with a patient with lung pathology, be it ARTs, cardiogenic, or cardiogenic, pneumonia, and uh, other lung pathologies, you may have to use, but do not use for severe metabolic acidosis and obstructive pathology. So initial sitting, as I said, calculate the tidal volume, then you need to calculate the respiratory rate, which I'll come later, so the oxygen issue. So always start with 100% oxygen, FiO2, for newly intubated patient, but start appearing it immediately within minutes or two. And our goal being, we should be between 60 to 40% of FiO2 should be between 60 to 40. Because if you let it run above that for a prolonged period of time, it is there is associated uh, oxygen-induced lung injury and associated uh, lung injuries, which will come as uh, other complications. So the goal being, by increasing or uh, manipulating the FiO2 to keep the oxygen saturation, peripheral oxygen saturation at 90 to 94% or above 60, 60 millimeters of mercury if you're using ABG or uh, arterial blood gas. So you need to do that. The other one is mean airway pressure. Okay, I'll come back to that again. I think mean airway pressure is my favorite one. So there is no actual dial to say it's the optimal mean airway pressure. You cannot set mean airway pressure on the mechanical ventilator, or there is no setting that you can actually is directly linked to the mean airway pressure. But rather, we play with the PEEP. So PEEP level should start at 5 centimeter of waters and go up. And always, whenever you increase any pressure, being PEEP or pressure, always keep an eye on peak and respiratory pressure. It shouldn't exceed more than 30, 35 centimeters of water. Even if it's exit in case of ARDS, it should be temporary. It should be reverted uh, as soon as possible whenever the hypoxemia is resolved. So the respiratory rate is also what we said commonly, other than the PEEP, other than the pressure or pressure being at the end, looking at the tidal volume, will be setting at uh, the respiratory rate. Usually respiratory rate is age dependent. So depending on the age, you may have more respiratory rate uh, 
for pediatric age groups and uh, lesser respiratory rate should be said for uh, adults also. But uh, side note to that would be always set the respiratory rate initially uh, at higher points if patient was having respiratory distress initially because it's a physiological mechanism, yes? So whenever you have any uh, poor oxygenation, you'll breathe fast. Whenever you are acidotic, you'll breathe fast. So always keep in mind what well, underlying problem is and think of maybe starting at higher range if patient was initially breathing at higher range because we don't want to... Uh, we hold the physiological responses. Of course, we need the physiological responses. So always keep in mind that the back of your head that to start with higher respiratory rate if patient was initially breathing very fast prior to putting on mechanical ventilator so that the physiological uh, responses and mechanism of adjusting things will continue. So the next is IE ratio. Usually, physiologically, as I mentioned a couple of times, and again, now that we spend more time in expiratory than in expiratory. So usually keep the, the in, at the initial setting, keep the expiratory time a bit longer. So one to two or one to three ratio. You can do this if you're using the pressure uh, mode. By actually, uh, sorry, by actually increasing the eye time or decreasing the eye time, you can manipulate that. And uh, if you are using uh, volume uh, control modes, usually they don't have IE, IE time to be set. So you usually play with the flow rate. So by manipulating the flow rate, you will adjust the inspiratory time. So indirectly, you will adjust the IE ratio. So always keep that in mind. So, but some machines may have uh, IE time to be set on volume mode. So you can set that, but if not, use the flow rate. Most machines usually rely with the flow rate when you are using the volume mode. So this is uh, the initial setting we need to do for mechanical ventilator. So what happens when we have ARDS? What happens when we have asthma and uh, other lung pathologies? So whenever we have ARDS, especially related to the COVID, uh, usually have uh, ARDS, bilateral lung parenchymal infiltrates, with a decreased uh, partial oxygen of partial oxygen saturation in the bloodstream. So in this case, we play with the oxygenation, which I discussed earlier. So how can we increase oxygenation? So one, to increase the mean airway pressure. How do you increase the mean airway pressure? Increase PEEP and, 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 just playing with you, to increase the inspiratory time so that the pressure or the inspiratory, the inspir by increasing the inspiratory time, so you're protecting the mean airway pressure. The other one is to play the FiO2. Usually we will raise, we'll raise the FiO2 higher levels, but it's not recommended to keep it on uh, that side for a long time. So that's basically what we can do with this with a ventilator or the other one is to, have, uh, to actually manipulate the flow uh, shape. So to make it uh, decelerating rather than a box shape. So that it will be more physiologic and higher percent of air or pressured air will get in more during initiation of pressure and it will be maintained for uh, some time. So that is more specifically with ARD. So by, uh, I didn't specifically go through that, but indirectly I have put uh, dropped a certain points of on oxygenation. So always keep that in mind. So the other important uh, part in operation of mechanical ventilation is knowing what those alarm mean. So you might not be respiratory, you, whoever is watching, might not be a respiratory physician or might not have uh, deep knowledge with mechanical ventilators, but we should be able to communicate whenever we have issues and we should always anticipate certain things, what it would be, uh, by knowing certain alarms. And I will try to mention the most common causes of, uh, most most common ventilate alarms. So, sophisticated alarms are built into those modern ventilators nowadays to ensure that the patient, uh, physician is alerted whenever there is a significant change in the specific parameters. And inbuilt alarms usually give the physician that or they foresee the development of complications and physician will be able to act on that. So 
I will discuss with ventilator alarms, the commonest, the common alarms that we face whenever we are using a mechanical ventilator. So the first alarm I want to discuss is low expiratory minute volume alarm. So I have touched a little bit about uh, minute ventilation earlier. So minute ventilation being a product of respiratory rate and tidal volume, yes. So we expect a certain volume to be, or the tidal volume that was given to come out. So it should be ideally should be equal. Inspiratory and expiratory tidal volume should be equal, ideally. So whenever we have low expired minute volume alarm, usually this alarm goes off whenever the expired volume falls below a certain level. Uh, so well, technically it means you're losing air somewhere. The air is going in the lungs, but not coming out, not coming out to be detected by the machine. So there's air loss in between. So this usually happens due to leakage. So leakage usually occurs at uh, ET tube or the ET tube cuff or tracheostomy tube cuff, in that, if it's inadequately inflated or ruptured. If there is any upward migration of the endotracheal tube into the larynx, the, the larynx there will be leakage of air. Another one is if there is a pneumothorax, uh, let's say a pneumothorax patient developed a pneumothorax, chest tube was inserted. So there is a continuous uh, communication between the lung parenchyma and the pleura. So there is a fistula, so air is leaking out. So whatever tidal volume the machine gives will not be coming out. So that will cause uh, this alarm to go out. But you don't expect this alarm to go out in a pneumothorax. Usually in pneumothorax, you, the alarm will be high pressure or a combination of both. Otherwise, this low expiratory volume alarm only does not mean there is any motorax, okay? So the other alarm and uh, the other spectrum of the alarm is high end expired minute volume alarm. So usually it's, uh, it's triggered due to uh, high expired minute volume or um, patient is hyperventilating. So, the time the alarm will be set whenever the patient is hyperventilating, so there will be high expired minute volume that we have set shouldn't be there. So many causes could cause the patient to hyperventilate. It could be a physiological response to hypoxemia, uh, acidosis, anxiety, pain, and a lot of reasons are there to cause hyperventilation. So the troubleshooting for this kind of issues is always check what is the cause of hyperventilation. Is the patient in pain? Is the patient having hypoxia? Or is the patient uh, having respiratory acidosis that is trying to compensate? And also, finally, but not least, also check the trigger mechanisms. Because usually, if you check uh, trigger and cycling setting, if there is a low pressure trigger for, for example, we set the trigger to be at two centimeters of water, that's the, the normal setting. So if you make it one centimeter of water for a slight pressure change, that will bring one centimeter of water, will initiate the press. So the patient will be hyperventilating or patient will be initiated. If patient's unconscious, there will be control brace. Uh, I mean, if patient unconscious or patient's initiating a brace in assisted mode, the patient will be delivered all the tidal volume, so the patient will be hyperventilating. So always check the trigger setting or the expiratory uh, percentage setting. If you set the expiratory setting, just a percentage at, usually we should say that 25%, if you make it 40%, uh, so it will start breathing very fast before it reaches the percentage of peak. Initiation, it will initiate an inspiratory, so they will be cycling, so patient will hyperventilate. Always first check the patient causes, that causes hyperventilation, then mechanical ventilator causes. Then you'll find the problem and you will be addressing it. So the other most common, and I can say the most common cause uh, of alarming is high pressure alarm. Usually this alarm, uh, goes whenever air pressure exceeds the set upper air pressure limit. So when we say the alarm, we say the set high pressure should be above 30, 5 centimeter or 40, uh, 40 centimeter of water. If the pressure exceeds that, then alarm will go off. We go on. So once the alarm is triggered, that high pressure alarm is triggered, the machine will try to cycle to expiration. So at the end, they will develop asynchrony. So inspiration will be terminated prematurely. So there will be asynchrony. So 
when when we set the upper air pressure limit, we usually set it above 10 to 50 centimeters of water above the peak inspiratory pressure. So usually the peak, observed peak inspiratory pressure should be 20. So when we usually set it, we set it above 35 and 40. So what can cause this high pressure alarm? Secretions are the most common cause that could cause this alarm. Uh, that is, there will be kinking or biting of the ET tube or uh, secretions obstructing the ET tube will cause the air repair to uh, go up and alarm to alarm. So the other cause could be slipping of the ET tube into the right main bronchus. I think we, we set the ET tube at a certain level of the trachea to ventilate both lungs. So pressure will be distributed, right? So if you put uh, the ET tube at one lung, especially if you migrate downward and goes to the right bronchus, and if you apply that that volume or pressure, obviously you'll have high pressure alarm going off. Then that will be an issue. So check whether the ET tube is where it is, where it's placed. So one, that could be one of the causes. The other one is patient-related causes. If a patient is coughing or a patient is awakened, fighting or agitated, that might trigger the alarm. And the other field complication of high pressure alarm is due to pneumothorax, be it atherogenic or any cause of pneumothorax, will trigger the alarm the, to, the alar to the alarm because there will be high pressure in the chest. So how do we troubleshoot this alarm? Always check for patency. Initially, we may initially we will check the patency of tubes. So it could be suctioning or manual bagging. And if it's obstructed, change the tube, obviously. And uh, if patient is biting, then we may have to insert uh, oral airway for the patient who might not, does not bite it, or we need to sedate the patient so that he wouldn't bite it. If there is a kink, uh, and if it could be straightened, do that. If not, change the tube. The other thing is we need to check M3 and percussion knots on the chest. Yeah, is this true of pneumothorax? And if bedside ultrasound is available, do chest ultrasound to check for pneumothorax, check, check for uh, barcode signs. If there are tears, then we need to deflate the needle, should be inserted and deflate the pressure so that the pneumothorax will be treated. Otherwise, the pressure alarm will be going off frequently. The other one is check possibility of worsening pulmonary edema or bronchospasm. So whenever you have worsening of the underlying condition, high alarm will go there. So check that also. And check for the presence of a massive pulmonary effusion. Whenever there is massive pulmonary effusion, there will be the lung compliance will be decreased. So it will need a lot of uh, pressure to deliver a certain volume or a certain volume to be delivered. There will be a need of high pressure. So the high pressure will alarm will go off. Always check wherever there is pulmonary effusion or ascites. You can do that by physical examination, auscultation, and uh, percussion notes, and the bedside ultrasound will do you magic and tell you what's underlying there. And finally, if the cause is patient coughing or fighting or patient is anxious, then we need to apply sedation so that the patient will not be fighting the machine and causing uh, the alarm to go off. And the other two alarms I would like to discuss finally would be the low airway pressure alarm that is usually set 10 or 15 centimeters below the observer peep. So if you say the observer peep being 20, so we expect the alarm setting to be five centimeters or 10 centimeters. The lower airway pressure should be five up to 10 centimeters. The other one is apnea alarm. So usually low airway pressure alarm is related with a leak or disconnected circuit. So similar with uh, uh low expiratory beaded volume so that is also could be the cause could be leakage or disconnected circuits the other alarm is apnea alarm apnea alarm is usually activated if a patient is not uh, attempting to breathe for 15 to 20 seconds uh, usually in spontaneous mode of breathing then the alarm will go on all the machines like Machines that were made previously might not have the feature of uh, automatically uh, setting a backup. So the alarm goes and we need to either change the mode to assist control or SIMV for that matter and uh, make the patient breathe again. And new machines that were made recently or after uh, the last two, uh, two decades they will have automatic, auto, automatically will go in the backup mode 
and they will ensure full mechanical support. So uh, that is for apnea alarm. So we have discussed on mechanical ventilators, on the modes, uh, way of delivery, mode of delivery, or mode of receiving, the individual modes, and how to improve oxygenation in a mechanical ventilator, and uh, how to improve ventilation. And we have discussed the alarm, the usual common alarm setting, alarm we have and alarm settings. And the final part would be the complication of uh, mechanical ventilators. So there are many complications related with mechanical ventilators. The uh, initial complication could be pre-intubation or peri-intubation complications that could be due to the drug we use or the uh, approach we used to have to secure AT tubes. So that could be laryngeal or pharyngeal trauma, esophageal intubation, well, the air, the AT tube is not placed in the uh, trachea rather than in the, in the esophagus. Or arrhythmia could be other cause, could be the drug we used, or manipulation of the airway could cause uh, vagal response to go on and cause arrhythmia. And aspiration, if a patient is not fully sedated or paralyzed, then he may develop aspirate, he may vomit, so aspiration might be there. The other one, bronchospasm associated with the drug, especially if you're using ketamine and the rapid sequence intubation, so they could cause bronchospasm. And the other co other complications are complications that are covered at any time being. So this could include ET tube obstruction, uh, airway drying, upward migration of ET tube, self-extubation, cough leaks could happen anytime, so anticipate this. So you probably will have the alarm going off if you have ET tube obstruction, high pressure alarm will be go on going off, upward migration of ET tube, the low expiratory volume alarm or uh, low expiratory volume alarm may be going off. And self-extubation and the cough leaks, yeah, they speak for themselves, I don't have to say much about them. The other complication I would like to say is the ventilator has with a lung injury. So whenever we have high pressure or volume delivered to the lung, we will expect barotrauma to occur to the alveoli. So alveolar rupture will lead to pneumothorax, and this could be their consequences. So these are other complications we should be aware of. The other one is the oxygen associated lung complication. So as we all know, high flow, high percentage of oxygen has, any, has a consequence. So it causes tracheobronchitis. So whenever we have high flow, if you're not using humidifiers and using high flow oxygen, it might dry the epithelia and there will be formation of uh, there will be formation of oxygen radical species that will augment or contribute to the inflammation and result in tracheobronchitis. And if you are using high flow oxygen and let's say there is a mucus plasma obstructing it, distal to the mucus plug, the alveolar or the airway would be fueled with high larger percentage of oxygen. So that means then after a while, that oxygen will get absorbed and the, that part will be atelectasis. So that's why I mean absorptive atelectasis. Reviews alveolar damage. Again, whenever you have high percentage of oxygen going to the alveoli, there will be high radical species and epithelial injury, which will in long run, may cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And the other complication is infection. So we are actually introducing a foreign matter of foreign material in the AT tube, and we are actually putting on uh, air or uh, pushing air down the airway, which will result in introduction of other pathogens if the environmental hygiene is not maintained and if it's not well sanctioned. Uh, oral uh, flora may migrate to the tracheal system could cause infection and they will result in ventilator associated pneumonia. Those are the most and common and feared complication and you should be aware that usually happens with 48 hours post intubation. The patient may develop fever and depending on the commonest pathology at your setting, could be SOS or uh, MRSA or Pseudomonas arginosa infections, so ventilator associated pneumonia also another possibility. So always uh, keep in mind of this complication whenever using ventilator. So so far that's what that's what we have what I have for you today. Maybe in the future we'll be discussing specifically on uh, 
being later stating for specific diseases and maybe on uh, the graphs on Scala use in the future, maybe if it's uh, possible. So this is what I have for today. And if you have any questions, please forward them. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat room and No questions so far. Okay, let me check if you have questions on the YouTube and I'll be answering that. Okay, there is one question uh, that is forwarded. Can you explain a little on how uh, we can identify P plot on my pressure plateau if not displayed? Okay. Okay, there is one question uh, that is forwarded. Okay. Can you explain a little on how uh, we can identify P plots on my pressure plateau if not displayed? Okay, uh, usually P plateau might not be displayed okay. in a lot of machines. And we usually rely with the peak inspiratory pressure and the mean airway pressure will be displayed. In most machines. So we rely with peak inspiratory pressure. As I told you earlier, in normal. Okay, there is one question uh, that's forwarded. Okay. Can you explain a little on how uh, we can identify P plots on my pressure plateau if not displayed? Okay. Uh, usually, P plateau might not be displayed okay. in a uh, lot of machines. And we usually rely with the peak inspiratory pressure and the mean air. Uh, sorry for the interruption. I uh, forgot to mute my YouTube. Sorry again. So as I was saying, P plateau might not be displayed, but uh, peak inspiratory pressure is displayed. So we normally, there is the difference between peak plateau and uh, peak inspiratory pressure uh, is five centimeter of water. So if you say it, uh, known that the patient is not, uh, does not have any asthma or bronchospasm or for that matter, we shall expect it to be five centimeters of water, the difference to be less than that. So if by knowing the peak uh, inspiratory pressure, we can assume that the plateau pressure will be less than by five or 
so that you will know that if we say peak and aspiratory pressure being 40 centimeters of water, so by assumption, it will be uh, 35 milliliters of water. But the best way of uh, detecting peak and aspiratory pressure would be to apply inspiratory hold while, uh, while on volume control. To apply the inspiratory hold 0 0.5 to 1, then uh, we can have that graph or we can have the uh, peak and P plateau calculated for us. And based on that, we can act. The other thing is to see the graph. See the graph while on volume mode and see whether are they both going up, the meaning the peak uh, inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure both going up. That's more of poor lung compliance. So if they are going both up, then you will know that the difference is more or less five and you can estimate based on that. Hope that will answer the first question. The second question is, uh, patients who developed uh, ARDS and uh, have asthma or uh, restrictive, I mean, obstructive airway disease. So first we need to treat ARDS, obviously. ARDS should be treated because oxygenation has to be improved. So after uh, addressing the oxygenation, we'll consider the uh, addressing the ventilation. So how do we optimize oxygenation? As I told you earlier, to optimize oxygenation, we may increase the PEEP, we may increase the eye time, if you're using pressure mode, or increase the mean after uh, the MAP in general and FIL2. And if we increase the, if we want to improve the ventilation in these patients, one, we have to make sure there is no bronchospasm. One, if there is bronchospasm, be it uh, being ARDS, you treat the asthma first. If there is no bronchospasm, in this case, we may uh, we may increase the respiratory rate so that they will have higher respiratory rate so that they will be improving uh, ventilation. The other one is to manipulate the expiratory time if it's an asthma patient. So by giving it a little, a bit more of expiratory time, then we'll be able to remove uh, carbon dioxide. But in this patient, always keep in mind to have an ABG uh, to be done because you might not know the level of carbon dioxide in the blood. So ventilation is important because we are more playing with removal of carbon dioxide. And I ratio, I time would be be sure, uh, will be long, will be prolonged in the ARDS, but in obstructive cases, eye time should be shortened so that you'll have more expiratory time, be it by manipulating the flow rate also. Any question or is that clear? Okay, I don't see questions being for others so far. Uh, thank you for, uh, uh, I guess, for listening to me. And um, hopefully we, I will do this again in the coming future, I guess. And have a nice day and have a nice evening.